Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're located. If I understand properly, we're covering a number of time zones this, uh, this morning. Uh, so thanks to all of you for joining and thanks to the uh, panelists for uh, also joining. So it is our pleasure today to discuss an issue that has become extremely sensitive in this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis context, which is economic security. And we'll, we'll be discussing this issue from uh, various perspectives, the, the business uh, sector perspective, uh, the uh, well, economic perspective, more uh, generally speaking, from uh, researchers in the economics. And we are very fortunate to have uh, three distinguished panelists with us this morning, coming from very different uh, backgrounds. So let me introduce them uh, first uh, by order of appearance uh, on, on stage, so, so to speak. So the first panelist will be Thibaut Moulin, who, is, who, who has both an engineering and uh, business school background. Uh, Thibaut Moulin is uh, working for a KYU Consulting, a management consulting firm specialized in customer experience, operations, and risk management. And on KYU, KYU, if I understand properly, Thibault is more specifically in, in charge of supply chain risk management, which is the reason why we asked him to join this panel. So he will be providing the business sector uh, perspective, so, so to, to speak. Uh, the second panelist will be Shin Oya, who is a senior consulting fellow at the Asia Pacific Initiative. He is uh, working for the Japan Bank for International Cooperation, JBIC, and he has uh, an extended experience. Uh, he has ha held various positions at JB, including Director of Asian Operation, Director of Oil and Gas Operation, uh, Chief Representative for New Delhi Office, and he, he is currently based in Washington, D.C., joining us at a very late time. <laughs> so thanks, Shin, for joining us at this very unexpected uh, time. Uh, and the third uh, panelist is Lorong Chen, who is a senior economist at the uh, Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia area based in Jakarta. So thanks for joining Lurong in the afternoon. That's for decent timing for, for you. So Lurong uh, received a, his PhD from a well-known institution, uh, the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, where I also come from. So we have the same alma mater. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Chen leads the area series of projects on digital economy. He's been specializing in digitalization over the past uh, couple of years, if I understand properly. And he's been also working quite extensively on regional integration and Asian uh, development. So three very good panelists, complementary, uh, I, I guess. Uh, before we start with the substance of the, of the seminar, uh, let me remind you remind the participants that they may ask their questions through the uh, Q&A uh, thread at the bottom of the, of the screen. I guess that everybody is now uh, quite uh, used to this uh, system. So don't hesitate to ask your questions. I'll collect them and then transfer them to the, uh, to the panelists. But now let's uh, shift to the uh, substance of this uh, seminar. So the reason why we chose to uh, focus on economic security for this very last event of our Japan program, the reason is that this economic security is today a very sensitive uh, problem. And this has become so in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. This COVID-19 crisis has laid bare the vulnerabilities of the global value chains who had been used to this global value chains, highly fragmented, highly geographically dispersed. And the crisis uh, highlighted the vulnerabilities and so the, the problems that may be associated with this uh, fragmented value chains. And as a result, uh, economic security is very much at stake in this, uh, in this context. And so there were uh, different responses given by different uh, countries uh, so as to reshore or relocalize or um, uh, diversify suppliers. I mean, there are a number of responses that were given. And so we'll be discussing all these uh, issues uh, this morning. So I will give the floor first to Thibault, who will provide, I guess, a relatively general uh, explanation about the risks, precisely, that the supply chains are, are facing. 
And uh, I suspect that he may be uh, discussing the barometer that KYU is producing about this uh, supply chain risks, uh, which is why I think he will he is the most uh, appropriate speaker to open up the, the discussion. So Thibaut, the floor is yours for about five to seven minutes maximum, because we would like to, this session to be quite, quite interactive. So you, you make your presentation first, and I'll give the floor to the others, but maybe they will want to react immediately to what you, you say. So don't, don't hesitate to jump in as soon as Thibaut is, uh, is finished, even before you offer your own uh, remarks. So Thibaut, the floor is yours for uh, yeah, five to seven minutes. Thank you. Don't forget to yes. unmute yourself. Yes. <laughs> and uh, unmute question, myself. One question, Francoise. Um, do you think it would be relevant if I'm sharing a, a bit of uh, documentation of this parameter to use? Oh, uh, sure. You may. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You may share your screen. Share screen somewhere, somehow. Yeah, I can see. Yeah. Can, can you share it or do I have to do something I think I so that we can share, share it? Let me know if you see. Okay, screen. that's great. Excellent. I will try to put that on a wide, wider screen somewhere here. Or there. Maybe. Yeah, it would be better. Okay, this way. perfect. Uh, so uh, this this barometer is, a, is a, an exercise we are conducting every year now. Uh, we launched that uh, two years ago. And uh, so we, we try to uh, interview um, professionals of uh, Mainly it's French French companies, but uh, of course they are they are operating globally and they have suppliers and supply chain across the globe, uh, as you as you mentioned, Francois, uh, just before the, the, the supply chains of global companies are very fragmented and comes from many many different countries in, in the world, and so we we uh, we interviewed uh, around 100 people who are in charge of purchasing of supply chain of risk management in their companies, and from Many different sectors and with uh, different supply chain profiles that you can see here. Uh, very complex with lots of suppliers, lots of customers, and much more simple with less suppliers and customers. So we we, we tried to uh, our purpose was to understand what happened during the, this crisis because it, it's clearly showed how the supply chain was very very uh, fragile and very uh, very main, in, involving a lots of interdependencies between all these countries. And so we, we asked them, okay, what happened? How did you manage this crisis? And how did you ensure the certain continuity of activity towards what happened first in China at the beginning of the year and then in the entire uh, world? And then we asked them also what, what, you, what, you, what you, I would say, foresee as risk uh, for, for the next years. Uh, does it change something for you in the next years? And how will you try to respond to that? And what are the main or you the main lever to, to, to be more resilient for the next uh, years uh, facing this kind of crisis or facing all other kind of crisis? And uh, the results was, uh, was very interesting because um, compared to what we, we saw in, in the year before in, in 2019, of course, there was a complete change in the in the the risk perception for these for these companies and uh, um, the first the really first risk now is clearly for them the economic risk meaning that for for them there will be a recession there will be uh, some in, in many different countries in 2021 uh, the, the economic recession will, will go on and will uh, increase uh, in, in a certain way and they are, they are really uh, they are really concerned about this uh, the lack of uh, economic growth and uh, the potential impact that could have on their supply chain and mainly the finance of their suppliers, but also, of course, in terms of uh, global turnover and uh, the ability they could have to, to get some margin from that and to uh, pursue their development and their investment for the next year. So this really is a big threat for them based on uh, what happened in 2020. Uh, the important thing to, to understand also is that we, we, we have lots of uh, people who are very operational guys, who are in charge of the supply chain, who are in charge of uh, really making the operation working in their company. And so that for them, that this one of the main risks also is regarding the way to, to plan their activity. Because um, we, we, they are coming from a world where I would say they could uh, very uh, rely on, on, rely on their own. Their historic 
data on, on some market uh, marketing surveillance tools that we could do. Uh, and and this uh, came from many, many different years of experience. But with this crisis and with the, the very complete change in the, in the economics uh, of the world, they are really, I would say, um, helpless facing the how can I plan my my uh, my needs? How can I plan my my purchase orders toward my suppliers? What kind of forecasting models do I have to use? Uh, and this is uh, for them a big question mark, and they really have to change their models for a new uh, new kind of model, which will be much more, I would say, on a day-to-day -day basis and much more reactive and much more agile to adapt their supply chains to this very new world. And uh, the, I, I will not go through the, the tenth uh, year, but uh, uh, this what what is really interesting also in our in our power meter, and I will go just a little bit later, later on that is well, how it evolved from last year and from this year. And you see that of course uh, the the risk re related to uh, the sanitary situation and the epidemic risk was already inside our power meter last year as one kind of risk that could happen, but it was really much more here, like maybe an uh, impact, but very not occurrence and very not frequent at all and very rare. So now we can see that the perception of this risk is much higher in terms of impact for sure, uh, but also in terms of frequency, because they are foreseen that maybe what happened this year could happen again. Uh, we don't know how this virus, virus could evolve from one year to another. And the, this uh, represents really kind of risk that they have to to deal with and it, it means for them a lot of things to be done also operationally because they already in 2020 uh, take some measures to protect their employees to to uh, to uh, adjust the way they will sell the product we are all talking a lot about the e-commerce the, e the, the all, all the, the e shopping and the click and collect stuff and stuff like that for the retailing but it's it's really something that will completely, uh, um, I would say, impact the, the, the supply chain and the operations. And the, they, have their re they really need to integrate this kind of risk in, in, their, in their perspective and in the, in the future of their, of their activity. Um, there are also interesting, other interesting risks. I, I talk about the, the cash position of companies, and it's really something that are a huge concern, I think, with the economic situation. For, for, for them, the, their suppliers and their critical suppliers for, for a part of them are really some, some, some very big concern if they, are, if they will be able to, to uh, continue to, to exist, I mean, in 2021, uh, depending on their treasury situation, on their cash, on their cash situation, and, and this is a huge concern for them. Um, maybe some, something which is um, interesting also in our barometer is to conclude also, because we don't have lots of time, it's, um, you will find many, many different info information in this, in this thing, but I will go in something very interesting here, is meaning that uh, we, we ask them, facing that, do you plan to change something in your supply chain? Do you plan to adapt and to adjust? And you talked, Francois, just before about the, the reshoring, the relocalization, and so on. It, it was something that, of course, we could, we could think about that uh, very logically to say, okay, we, we are very dependent to too many countries in the world because our players are spreading and are very everywhere. If we would like to take more control about that, we need to reshape and to relocate our supply chain. And it's true that for a majority, big majority of them, 77%, the, the respondents are saying that, yes, we will have to change the profile of our supply chain. But changing the profile is, doesn't want to, it doesn't mean 100% that we will actually wish we, we shoring here in France, for example, for the French company or in other countries for other countries' company. What it's meaning is that, uh, first of all, they will put much more data on the, on the supply chain. They will much more put survey on the, on the supply chain to try to understand it better and to try to also have much more feedback from it to be able to be more agile in, this, in, this, in, in such a situation and to be sure that they know exactly what they purchase, where they purchase it, uh, where is the, 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 the merchandise, uh, what are the logistic flows, 
uh, and how could I change from one scheme to another? So this is one of the major things. Of course, they will rethink the supply chain, but much more by diversifying their, 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 their supply chain in terms of uh, region. And, and uh, I, I, I think that for, for um, companies who are very dependent to Asia, for example, uh, in Europe, um, a lot of them are thinking now about how can I re relocate um, some some supply chain, some a part of my supply chain. Maybe it will be uh, with warehouse, maybe it will be with suppliers, maybe it will be with production uh, sites. In, but uh, in Europe and or or close to Europe, so we are talking a lot about, of course, Eastern Europe. It will be, it will be uh, some 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 part of the solution, or maybe north of, of, of Africa. Um, of course, Turkey, which uh, politically is it's a little bit uh, it's a concern, but uh, because we of course these companies need also to keep their competitiveness level, and it's uh, as it is a very also a matter a huge matter for them. Uh, we are not talking today with them uh, for for solutions of uh, relocalization in France for French companies. That that's that will be. Maybe uh, some part of them will do that with, when they have a very high value uh, of, on their product or when it is really a concern of uh, strategy and uh, to be really very, very, very uh, agile and reactive for, 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 for some product and some production. But we don't think that it will be uh, for, for a very massive, um, I would say, change in the, in, the, in the supply chain in this way. Um, there will be much more. Uh, stocks and th this really changed the way people are thinking about stocks because uh, we for, for the moment they are they're thinking a lot about that in terms of economics and how I can can I uh, improve my stock level to uh, get some some more uh, some some uh, some savings here and there and to uh, and now the, the risk uh, is also to be taken into consideration much much more than than before and to to uh, to end my my uh, my introduction and my global content here and general things, we say we say that one of the key things also for them is to collaborate uh, much more with their uh, counterparts and with their supply chain uh, actors and collaborators, uh, suppliers, distributors, to really have uh, and to really animate a kind of ecosystem. I would say uh, uh, into uh, into uh, into their business continuity plan for for today these these companies uh, in fact they are ready to um, implement and to and to i would say to operate a business continuity plan in in, in a small scale i mean for a production site after a fire or, or for or in case of a strike or something like that but to think through a global continuity plan involving all all the, the partners of their supply chain will be Another uh, another step for them in the next years. So that's that's it basically. I hope I, I wasn't too long before. Francois, as you tell me. <laughs> no, this is perfect. Thank you, thank you, Thibaut, for providing this. Uh, uh, well, setting this the stage basically for the for the discussion. Yeah, I think that this, this issue of stocks is quite interesting. My understanding is that it may be the end of the just in time uh, approach. That was very uh, well fashionable at, at some point. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I have a couple of questions about why, why the companies you know, change their, uh, their tactics uh, or strategy, and we'll, we'll be discussing that uh, l later on. Because th some uh, recent um, studies actually point to slightly different conclusions than the, uh, what, the, you know, what we may think. And it may be intuitively convincing to say, well, let's reshore, let's localize, and we'll make the, the supply chain more, uh, more resilient. But it, that's not all that obvious. But we'll, we'll be discussing that, I guess, uh, eventually. So before we do that, let me give the floor uh, to uh, Shin uh, Oya, who will, uh, I guess, um, explain the implication of this crisis for Japan's economic security. I guess everybody is aware that uh, the Japanese government has taken uh, very uh, energetic measures to respond to the uh, to the crisis. So uh, Shin will explain us in more details what the Japanese strategy has been 
and what the implications of the crisis have been on uh, Japanese economic security. So Shin, the floor is yours for same thing, about uh, seven minutes max. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, <clears throat> first, uh, COVID-19, of course, uh, provided the huge impact on Japan. Uh, but uh, actually, this is not the first time for a Japanese company or Japanese government uh, consider seriously about supply chain shock. For example, in 2010, China actually stopped the export of rares to Japan. This related to Senkaku uh, Islands. So we faced a huge difficulty for secure rares. This is 2010. Well, for example, in 2011, there is East Japan Great Earthquake. So Japanese, uh, many, many factories, including automobile, face difficulty for continuing its operation. Or well, flood in Thailand happened uh, same year, 2011. And uh, it started from the uh, July, August, September kind of things. <clears throat> and as you know, many, many Japanese uh, factories, especially automobile-related factories located in Thailand, so they faced a huge difficulty. And uh, Japan Bank for International Cooperation, JB carried out some survey. Uh, this is in 2016. We asked a question to Japanese companies. And uh, responding to this question, uh, more than 57% of Japanese companies responded that uh, they already uh, diversified the supply chain to reduce vulnerability. So my first point is that uh, COVID-19 is a big issue, but this is not first case. We experienced that and the companies seriously consider what's good for them because continuous supply for them is very important uh, to, uh, in the relationship with customer. But as many people mentioned, uh, it's quite important for them to strike right balance between efficiency and also resilience. So this is number one. And but going back to COVID-19, effect of COVID-19, uh, uh, I think there are uh, three impacts. First one is COVID-19 itself. So this started in the Wuhan, China, and there is uh, a Japanese uh, factory in Wuhan too. So some Japanese automobile factory in Japan cannot continue its operation because uh, part supply cannot, couldn't come from uh, Wuhan. And after that, uh, mask or some growth supply stopped. So Japan also, because Japan also infected and the uh, uh, number of uh, infected increased. So we faced difficulty for securing that uh, so-called PPE. So this is direct effect of uh, COVID-19. Second effect is US-China tension has been intensified. This is not only because of COVID-19, but that clearly COVID-19 intensified this uh, I mean, uh, conflict. So US imposed export control, furthermore, and China also started import, uh, and, uh, employ export control and also Chinese entity list. So Japanese companies are facing a difficult situation. This is number two. And the point number three is that the China started to use economic coercion against Australia. And uh, again, uh, there is some history for China using economic coercion. Uh, this is not first time. But uh, against Australia, uh, aggressive utilization of economic coercion, we can uh, notice. And the reason is uh, many people believe that because Australia proposed independent study of origin of COVID-19, so China restricted import of beef, barley, wine, and coal from Australia. But the rest of, rest of the world, including Japan, is watching this very closely. So this adds some risk for concentrating business operation or trade with China, I think. So at least three elements are coming from COVID-19 itself. So how Japanese, uh, I mean, uh, Japan responded to this one thing is that the uh, uh, Japanese government allocated some budget. This is approx approximately 2.2 billion US dollars for diversifying factory. Mainly we are considering from China. 
And、uh, I mean,、uh, destination country can be、uh, ASEAN or can be India or can be Japan too,、uh, reshoring. But anyway, main uh, element, uh, main reason is diversification. So this is number one. And also, number two, this is not just because of COVID 19, but the、uh, Japanese uh, government uh, emphasizes more and more about、uh, economic security. So within NSS, We set up economic、uh, division in NSS. So, this means that the economic element of national security is right now a center stage in Japanese government and Japanese policy making.、Uh, I will stop there. And I'm happy to get a、uh, question and answer. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Shin, for this.、Uh... Well, these introductory remarks. Well, perhaps one, one first question, detailed question about what you, what you said. Well, you say that the government made a decision, okay, and,、uh, and allocated a budget, $2.2 billion, that's a lot, or to help con、uh, well, companies diversify. One first question has this money been used? Because, you know, there, it is a de decision. On the part of the government, but the companies may not be exactly on the same line. And as, as you rightly say, there is this trade off between efficiency and security. And the, the government and the companies may not exactly see eye to eye on this trade off precisely. So, has this money been used, which may be a first sign that the, 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 the strategy adopted by the government is the right one? If the companies you know, use the money, well, it's, it suggests that they, they think that it, it is quite, quite useful to move the, the way the government is suggesting. So, what was the case? Very good question. And the short answer is yes, money has been utilized, and the application is huge. So, I cannot predict exactly, but the probably、uh, additional budget allocation will happen.、Uh, this is supplementary budget, it's coming in January. So, probably in this、uh, supplementary budget,、uh, additional money will come. The reason money is going to be utilized is, is basically this is a subsidy. So, for a company, this is a, a kind of easy money. And of course,、uh, they are going to use for that appropriate purpose, but the、uh, money、uh, can be utilized. However, <clears throat> more important、uh, thing is that、uh, this 2.2 billion、uh, US dollars, this is not small money, but this is not big money, actually. There are many, many Japanese investments in China. And、uh, for example, automobile manufacturing、uh, factory,、uh, no company is shifting、uh, such big factory from China to other c o u n t r i e or to Japan. So, Many Japanese people do not think that we are not、uh, going toward complete decoupling. China is still important as a manufacturing center, and China is still important for、uh, the market as a market. However,、uh, selectivity is important if it's really value added、uh, and the very sensitive、uh, that the manufacturing sector, or if it's uh, I mean,、uh, medical related uh, production, uh, Japan would like to diversify. And this subsidy can be effective to some extent, but we should not have an illusion that we can completely decouple from China. But, but anyway, very good question. Thank you. Okay, well, well, I guess we'll, we'll come back to this,、uh, this question in more, in more detail eventually. But before we do that, let me give the floor now to、uh, Laurent Chen, who will be discussing、uh, the case of the other countries, those at the receiving end, so, so, so to speak. So, Laurent, what I would like、uh, to ask you is to explain the implications for Southeast Asian countries. Those that are supposed to be the, the location where Japanese companies, in particular, may relocate. So, what have been the implications for those、uh, countries of a reorganization or restructuring of these、uh, supply chains? So, Laurent, the floor is yours. Same thing, same treatment, about <laughs> five to seven minutes. <laughs> Up to you to、yes. decide. <laughs>、yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Feng Shuas. So,、um, as for the GBC reorganization in Southeast Asia, here actually my observation is that there are two、uh, main trends of change. First is a so called upgrade of GBCs. 
And second is, as uh, the former two speaker already mentioned, the reallocation of GBCs. Um, first, this uh, the upgrade of GBCs is mainly driven by the digital transformation of the economy. This is something occurred not only just in Asia, but elsewhere in the world. To simplify, let me uh, call uh, the, the, the uh, production sharing network existing in Asia as GBC 1.0 and the one that uh, it's going to upgrade to as GBC 2.0. So in GBC 1.0, we know that production is not necessary to uh, be an integrated process. Uh, instead, it can be internationally, internationally fragmented into a variety of uh, activities and carry out uh, where the necessary skills and resources are most uh, competitive uh, uh, available. And also this network can be coordinated via service links. By doing so, um, we see production can actually be shared by producers uh, geog geographically located in different areas. And between countries, we see there's um, uh, more and more things to be traded, um, especially passing components and intermediate goods. So um, here we see that GBC 1.0 lower the, uh, the threshold for developing countries to participate in international uh, division of labors and provide opportunities for Asian countries, especially China, to achieve fast economic growth in the past few decades. Then um, current stage, as digitalization further, device, uh, further drive down trade costs and more important facilitate the movement of people, skill and services, GVC is upgrading to a new form, so-called GVC 2.0. And in, in GVC 2.0, not only production, but also task will be internationally fragmented. Services rather than products will be the main source of value added and also data and information become a main content of exchange across country. This will provide more opportunities for, and for individuals, actually this provide more opportunities for them to create values through the services they can provide based on their abilities and expertise. Um, so uh, with all these uh, features, we can see that GBC 2.0 will there will be some fundamental difference um, between GBC 2.0 and GBC 1.0. And as for East Asian age countries, part of part of GBC reorganization actually will be related to this uh, digital transformation and and GBC upgrades. So this is my uh, first point. My second point is about the reallocation of GVC. So uh, more precisely is that industry move, moving out from um, China and relocate to uh, other Asian countries. Uh, this has been happening before the uh, COVID pandemic actually. And a direct trigger uh, of this GVC reallocation, um, and I mean, from economic perspective is the slowdown of Chinese economy. Um, and because of that, investors start to be less confident about Chinese market and thinking about how to relocate um, their production activities. Um, there are several evidence, for example. First, as we know that made in China today is not as cheap as it used to be because of the increasing labor costs and also the inflation of property uh, price. Uh, second, we the, the, there's also observation that uh, recently the overall business environment in China is not it is less favorable to many foreign companies and also to domestic uh, MSMEs, micro and medium uh, enterprises, um, and even for big multinational uh, companies. Um, in a survey, we received a feedback that some of them also uh, complain that uh, it's not as easy as before for them to do business in China, um, especially when um, they need to face direct competition with the, the big state-owned enterprises. 
and, and third, um, as we observe, there's some unsolved problems existing in Chinese economy, for example, the local government debt and, uh, and the real estate bubbles are increasing prominent, especially when the economic uh, growth slow down. So all these are factors uh, that increase the uncertainty of the Chinese market and cause investors, not just foreign investors, but actually also um, Chinese investors to, to, to think about how to relocate the production um, to other country. And, and this process also bring the, the, the value chains that link to those uh, production, production activities. So, um, and related to the COVID, um, uh, I think COVID pandemic will definitely affect this GVC re reorganization in both trends, both the upgrade part and the re reallocation part. And for the upgrade part, uh, many people believe that the, the, the COVID pandemic will accelerate digital transformation. And personally, I tend to uh, agree this opinion. Related to GVC reallocation, so relocate production to other Asian countries, um, I don't think the COVID-19 will, will reverse the trend, but it will actually increase uh, the uncertainty in this uh, transition, uh, in, in this transition. And, um, but, but, but how this will really affect uh, ASEAN countries, I think we, we, can, we can exchange uh, our opinion in this uh, webinar, how it will really affect ASEAN countries. Uh, the general observation is that countries are already realized this opportunity and Asian countries are competing to grasp this opportunity. But the real effect depends on uh, not just how they accept those relocate industry, but also how they improve the, the, the digital trans transformation of their own economy to, to, to host new GVC, so-called GVC 2.0. Yeah, thank you, Feng Shui. Well, thank you, Lorong. Perhaps a, a remark on what you said. Well, I fully agree with you that the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis may have accelerated pre-existing trends. And we are, had already observed that uh, there, were, there were relocation of production away from China to uh, some Southeast Asian countries. But precisely since this trend had already been ongoing, some countries which had benefited from this pre-existing trend are, I think, in a better position than others to seize this opportunity. So my, my problem here is that it may widen the gaps between the, the economies in their region. Of course, I'm thinking in particular of Vietnam. Vietnam was the country where a number of companies had already relocated in response to the rise in labor costs in China, in particular to concerns about the hardening of the political stance uh, and many, many reasons pushed some co companies out, out of China and to other locations. And Vietnam was one of these locations. And so Vietnam is uh, in a better position than some others because the, the, the conditions are already there. So it's not extremely complicated for companies to decide to move to Vietnam. They know where they are going and the country itself is prepared to host more companies. So uh, my, my concern here from a purely ASEAN perspective is, is isn't there the risk that Vietnam may uh, well, take it all <laughs> and some other countries may be then at a disadvantage compared to, to Vietnam. So what, what do you think? Is it something that is being discussed within ASEAN or uh, at area? Oh, oh thank you, Feng Shuas. Um, this is a hot topic. First of all, I, I, I really don't think Vietnam can take all. And um, one issue related is the capacity. Is it capable to take all? Um, you, you compare the, the market potential, you compare the, uh, the, 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 the productivity. I don't think Vietnam can take, take all. And one aspect, you, you will look at the, 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 the progress of digital adoption. This is one of very important components of this uh, capacity in accept GVCs. We see that there's also um, a lot uh, to improve in Vietnam when compared to other ASEAN countries. And, and one issue we, we try to avoid, as you mentioned, to avoid, avoid this uh, development gap result from industry, from this GVC relocation is that we try to uh, avoid digital divide among the region. 
and this that's kind of a, a preparation or, or kind of condition to avoid this potential uh, development gap. But of, of, but of course, the, you, you try a very important question. But I would like to mention that in, in, the, in addition to Vietnam, we also see that Thailand, they also accept new, new uh, sectors and big market like Indonesia, they try to catch up and, 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 and also zero enemy countries, uh, they're also thinking about how to, to take this opportunity and more advanced economy like Singapore, also thinking how to improve their service uh, provide to the region to, to make the whole region move together. So uh, personally, I'm more optimistic that, um, yeah. Well, good, if you're optimistic. Well, I think there are different opportunities for different countries, I, I suppose. But there, there are limits to what some, some countries can do for a digitalization, as you rightly say. Well, the conditions have to be in place in some countries for this digitalization to, to happen. And this is not all, all that uh, easy, perhaps. Uh, well, before I get the, the question from the, uh, the audience, let me ask myself a couple of questions to uh, each of you. Well, one first remark. I just came across very recently, that is yesterday or day before yesterday, a study by the OECD, which I found quite disturbing because it is totally in contradiction with what, with what is intuitively convincing, which is that relocation or relocalization rather of production of supply chains may not be the way to go. So this study, uh, examines the impact of a shock similar to the COVID-19 crisis on two sets of uh, supply chains. It's a simulation exercise in a computable uh, general equilibrium model. And so there, there are two sets of uh, supply chains, one which is shorter, close to the, uh, the producer, and another one which is more fragmented, more geographically dispersed, et cetera. And what they, they find out is that the local supply chain does not do better than the other one. Actually, the, the conclusion is that localizing value chains would add to the economic losses and make domestic economic, econo economies more vulnerable. So it's, it's totally in contradiction with the uh, expectations. And the, the reason, well, it's a, it's a simulation exercise, but they, what they, the conclusion is that more localized regime delivers neither greater efficiency nor greater stability. I find that a bit uh, yeah, <laughs> disturbing because it's not exactly what you, you would uh, expect. So uh, my question now is not, I'm not quarreling or quibbling with the, uh, <laughs> the result of the, uh, the study. My question is, uh, first have companies try to rely on empirical evidence before taking or making the decisions. And similarly, have countries or governments also considered some empirical evidence before pushing for relocalization or reshoring, et cetera, et cetera. Or is it just based on, you know, well, gut feeling basically. So what do you, what do you have to say about that? Well, perhaps Shin first, has Japan, you know, thought in more details about the, the costs and uh, gains of, of strategies, or is it just based on yeah, intuition? I think uh, each company is, of course, each company carries out very detailed analysis, of course. <clears throat> and uh, one of analysis is based on the, the past experience or data, so they try to get a lot of information. However, uh, some element is very difficult to uh, quantify, for example, element of risk, political risk, or, uh, or even the concept of uh, resilience itself is very difficult to quantify. I mean, resilience is if something happened, but the probability of that something happened cannot be not easily quantified kind of things. So, uh, I do not think, uh, I mean, by automatically calculating uh, any data, uh, single answer will come. I, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, animal spirit uh, can affect. And at the same time, going back to that uh, uh, relocalization conundrum, 
I think it also depends on that uh, what kind of products they are producing. I mean, <clears throat> if trade cost is not so high, fragmentation type of operation can be efficient, even though after considering factoring the risk of vulnerability. But if cost is high, I mean, transportation cost is high, maybe relocation can be one way. So we cannot overgeneralize uh, industry or uh, I mean, it depends on products. It depends on the, the parts or I mean, uh, natural resources if they are going to use. And also it depends on the final product. Th that's my feeling. <laughs> Sorry, this is not exact science, but just feeling. <laughs> But, no, I guess you're right. I guess the, you know, the, yeah, yeah, I'll give you the floor, don't worry. Yeah, so, I, I well, guess example, you... Why not think that, for example, <clears throat> especially automobile industries, as I mentioned, that not a mega uh, automobile manufacturer is uh, trying to get out of China because they are mainly focusing on that the Chinese market not exporting from China, but uh, they are uh, I mean, uh, focusing the Chinese market. In this case, maybe it's very difficult for them to get out of China. And of course, China's uh, I mean, uh, labor cost is increasing, but still, as far as they are focusing on Chinese market, maybe they stick to China, I think. So it also depends on whether they are trying to export or they are trying to uh, focus on domestic market. And this is a huge difference, I think. No, sure, I fully agree. It all depends on what your uh, objective is. And, and China, China, you know, the companies will not all pull out of China because China is still a big market, whether you like it or not. So depending on what you want to do in China, whether you want to produce there for export purposes or whether you want to produce in China for the Chinese market, your decision is totally different, of course. But I, I, to, to come back to what I was, I was uh, commenting before, I think that the, yeah, the, the trade-off, efficiency security trade-off, may differ from, from one company to another, from one sector to an, another. So the way you solve this issue depends on a number of things and there is no general uh, response, uh, I guess. But Thibault, you wanted to add, ask Sana or add? Yes, it, it, just to, 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 to say in the, in exactly what was, has been mentioned here, is it's, it will be much more, uh, risk will only be an additional, uh, yeah, parameters to be taken into account in this kind of decision. But of course, the first things will be the, the business models you could have by implementing your production uh, site in some area where you maybe have a, mar a market, first of all, and, and then uh, a, a, I would say a, a logistic flows to distribute your product uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a typical region. And what will be the change for, for tomorrow maybe will be, of course, the kind of potential budget uh, and potential subsidies or potential tax uh, system that will be put in place in the different countries here and there to facilitate and to uh, the investment in, in, in production first. That, that will be the first, one of the first things that will companies will add in their model. And the only thing I would say that maybe to compare to yesterday, they will potentially add some, some risk uh, environments much more some risk analysis much more than what they did before. And uh, that might slightly change their decision of investment here to, to in, in a country or another. And uh, that, I think that that could be uh, the major impact for, for business tomorrow. And, and again, if I don't know the exact content of your of the study you mentioned, but it's true that if we are taking a, into account um, the, the current situation uh, of, of uh, the economics and the policy government, the government policies in the world. I'm not sure that the relocalization will either bring any uh, additional uh, margin or any additional competitiveness uh, level for, for these companies. But in the uh, tomorrow, maybe with some changes here and there, uh, and with additional risk taking into account for business decision, maybe it will, it will change, uh, have an impact to, to relocate a bit, at least from one big region to another when you want to export product from one region to another. At least this, this could have an impact for such situation. 
Yeah, so what you're say saying in the, in the first part of your comment, you have to factor in more things. So, so you have to put in more things into the equation. And on top of that, you may also have to change the coefficients on the various factors. Yeah, that's uh, that's basically the the way way to look at it. Well, but before I open to the uh, to the audience, uh, Laurent, do you have a reaction to uh, what uh, what we what we said and to this uh, the conclusion of this OECD study, for instance, uh, or or no? Yeah, no, no, no much. I, I haven't read the report, so I, I I doubt whether I can have very good comments. One observation is that. As you mentioned, it's a, a this a variation within the country or, or, or between the country. One factor to consider is the connectivity. Here in Asia, we see that in some sub-region cooperation, uh, it's better than the domestic cooperation is because the connectivity is better. It's easy to reach out other country than uh, to other area in within the same country. So this connectivity could be the factor to explain why in some cases this international cooperation is easier than domestic cooperation. That's a, an interesting point, which actually brings me to a question that I wanted to ask you, which is about ASEAN as an institution, I mean, as a cooperative uh, endeavor. Has there been something decided at the ASEAN level about this uh, reorganization of uh, supply chains and all, and all this? I mean, is it, is it something that, that has been discussed at the ASEAN level? And if yes, are there specific measures that have been put in place to precisely facilitate the reorganization restructuring of the, the supply chain within ASEAN? Um, I would like to say uh, yes and no, it depends on how you interpret this, uh, this regional action. For example, I, I, what I see is that for Asian, there's a, a substantial effort to improve connectivity, not just within ASEAN, but also ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus six. Then the reason concluded uh, ASEP is a kind of a, a, a proof that uh, there's an achievement in this. So uh, I would say ASEAN's action is more inclusive, uh, inclusive minded. So um, to, to, to accept the relocate industry, is not necessarily kind of excluded, as we, as we mentioned, the Chinese market, but in, in, instead to enhance the link to the Chinese economy and to facilitate these uh, uh, industry fragmentation. So allow them to, 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 to base on, on more rational economic decision to look for more competitive location to, 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 to produce uh, their products. And in these ways, and one dimension, and another effort is that in addition to economic concern, um, social culture uh, consideration is always uh, is already highlighted in ASEAN agenda. So, in a, in addition to economic cooperation, more and more we are going to see is the, the, the cooperation in a social and cultural uh, dimension. Okay. Well. Uh since you talked about RCEP, which is the <laughs> one of the topic of the day, uh, well, let's let's um, yeah go on 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 RCEP. So, this regional comprehensive economic partnership uh, is about facilitating uh, trade, but also facilitating precisely the uh, development of uh, global value chains within the region, and uh, with the one single. Uh, rule of origin, so to speak, and one single certificate to produce, to move things around the, the, the region, it will certainly make things much easier for, for companies. So would you say that uh, RCEP would provide a solution by combining elements of global and local value chains at the, at the same time? Well, RCEP um, just concluded in, in November, and it, it took much longer than many people expect to conclude. So this also reflect uh, how many difficulties or uh, issues that the uh, negotiator need to solve. So um, if it is asked the final solution, I, I, I don't think so. Um, look at the contents. If you we will compare the content of RCEP and CP, TPP, I, I see there's a question from uh, Mr. Seaman in the, in the chat box. So compared to CPTPP, actually the labor or we call the quality of RCEP is actually still uh, quite low, uh, lower than we expected. Um, it, and, 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 and the way RCEP is important is that it, is, it actually so, so, 
first sell the Asian countries kind of a, um, uh, the, the reform to their, their reform. Because in, in ASEAN, when you reach a regional agreement, the, the very important element is that it provides a guidance for those countries' domestic reform. So, so in this regard, ASEAN is just a milestone to, to, to push country to, to reform to a certain stage. And then to move further step, I think we need maybe ASEAN 2.0 or ASEAN 3.0. This is, a, a, this is a, a general response to your question. Uh, yeah. Well, I agree with you that an RCEP has just been signed. It has not been ratified yet, and uh, it will take time before uh, things actually show on, on the ground. So it, it will take time. It took time to negotiate the, uh, the agreement. It will, take time. it will also take time to implement it. Uh, uh, all right, so uh, now let's move to the uh, uh, questions from the uh, audience. So what kind of question do we, do we have? Oh yeah, there's a question on Turkey. I'm not sure anybody can, is uh, very uh, at ease on this one. Can we measure the impact of the international posture of Turkey on loss of opportunities in terms of reshoring? Anybody on Turkey or are, are Japanese companies interested in Turkey or no? Nothing to say about Turkey or, or, or is there something in your barometer to Thibault about uh, specifically uh, we... about Turkey? We, we know uh, Turkey in, a, in the automotive sector in Europe uh, is really important uh, as there are lots of uh, suppliers and also production sites for, for many brands, in European brands like uh, Renault, Volkswagen, PSA. Uh, there they are very, uh, there are strong links with, uh, with suppliers in, in Turkey. And uh, for, for what I know today, we are with customers of our consulting firm, which are automotive suppliers also and, uh, and automotive constructors. We don't see uh, any kind of uh, impact uh, related to the business they have in Turkey uh, regarding what happens uh, to the geopolitical uh, uh, state of uh, and the position of, of, of Turkey in, uh, in Okaraba and so on. So it's uh, no, no, not so far, I would say. Uh, of course, if the, the French uh, the French relationship uh, with the Turkey. Um, I would say um, goes in the wrong direction, might have some impact at the end of the day, but uh, we, we don't see, foresee for, for years to come any big um, impact here. Also, we have to, to, to remind that uh, Turkey uh, uh, has a very important political relationship, not only with France, but also with Germany and with Europe uh, globally with the immigration problem. So, um, we don't see any any kind of uh, real impact uh, today. Okay, thank you, Thibault. And, and this is based on uh, the survey that you that you conduct regularly. So, I mean, this it's, is really... yeah, it's based much more re re relationship we have today with okay. big big uh, companies, automotive companies in France. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, oh, I guess that this one is perhaps uh, more to Lurong than anybody else. It's about the technologies that will that may have an impact on supply chain management. So what kind of technologies are the, the most important? I mean, for, for instance, is 3D printing an, uh, an important strategy that may change things? And uh, does it precisely help reduce uh, or, or minimize uh, uh, costs, minimize losses to reduce costs? So what, yeah, what do, you, do you think, Laurent? Um, yeah, I will, I will tell a first shot. Um, I, in my point of view, I would think big data is the most important thing. And related to GVC, I think when we especially talk about economic security or the resilience of GVC, actually in many countries' minds, that big data. Uh, we know that in China has a very um, a, a, a big industry cluster in China, and with digitalization, allowed China to take this as an advantage to collect big data, which will pretty sure become the new uh, new blood. Of a, of a global economy because thinking about the AI, thinking of robotic, uh, or machine learning, that all depends on the big data. And I think um, as I communicate with uh, other people, they also consider that in other countries, in that if all industry located in China, then China have this big advantage to collect big data, which can later transfer into the competitiveness in the, in, uh, in the future. So, and, and other countries 
without that kind of a, a resource to collect data, you actually um, facing a, a kind of a, a difficult to, to think about how you are going to compete with this uh, big data country in the future. So um, that's, a, that's my quick response to this question. Yes, data um, is the new oil. Uh, people uh, uh, oh, yes. <laughs> tend to say, and uh, I think that's uh, that's exactly it. <laughs> well, a question for you, Shin. Well, there are a couple of questions re revolving around the same uh, issue, and it's about national security and government. Uh, so what are the main priorities of this new economic section that is uh, that has been opened within the National Security Secretariat? The N you, you mentioned this NSS with an economic division within the NSS. So can you say more about this and what are the priorities of this uh, new economic division within the NSS? I think, uh, I mean, the coverage is very broad. Uh, I mean, for example, individual ministry also has an economic security section, for example, uh, that the METI set up uh, economic, uh, I think, security division. But uh, NSS, this is uh, carrying out the overall coordination. Therefore, uh, their coverage is very broad. Uh, so of course that uh, general, uh, for example, export controlling or, or uh, that uh, uh, investment screening, this is cooperating between METI and NSS, but uh, NSS also cover, for example, uh, that uh, uh, issue of uh, COVID-19 itself. They are also involved in this kind of things. So coverage is very broad. And this is just established. Uh, so right now, uh, I mean, they are uh, I mean, trying to figuring out what kind of job they should do. But the one thing I can say is their uh, coverage is right now very broad. Many job is uh, coming to them. That's my understanding. And one additional question, uh, use, well, very often at least, what China does other countries in the region imitate. <laughs> it, it is quite quite common to see other countries replicate what Ch Japan has been doing. On this specific point, are you aware of other countries that also took the same kind of measures as, as Japan? So setting up a, a unit on national security or something? Well, an economic, think, economic aspect of national security. Yeah, yeah. Hmm? I don't know so well about other countries, but what I can say is, of course, as you know very well, in case of the United States, they have a National Economic Council, NEC, and uh, they are handling uh, economic issue together with uh, NSC. They are coordinating very well. So when uh, Japanese government set up this uh, economic center uh, in relation with national security, there are a lot of discussion uh, whether uh, we are going to uh, uh, use uh, US NEC type of organization or we put some division inside uh, NEC in case of Japan, NSS. So we decided that we are going to put some division in NSS. In other Asian countries, uh, to be honest, I don't know. But uh, my gut feeling is that the economic sphere is uh, more and more important uh, in the future. So as uh, one and more countries try to uh, expand uh, their uh, capacity for economic security, even though they are not setting some office within NSS, uh, for example, in uh, trade ministry or in economic ministry or can be in that uh, state department, such function may be expanded even in other countries, I think. Lurong on that, are, are there uh, countries within ASEAN, for instance, that are that set up similar uh, <laughs> divisions or something? Or? Uh... Oh, well, this, um, I don't know, but, but frankly speaking, um, uh, for ASEAN country, because the small size economically and, and also geographically closer to a, a big player, I think this is always something uh, that, 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 that some, some, some policymakers worry about, but uh, whether they have this kind of division, I don't know, but we can understand they have always this kind of concern that, but as far as there's a, a kind of a, a Chinese market that is open and willing to integrate to global economy, I think uh, neighboring countries are less 
uh, worrying about that. Okay. Uh, well, to, for, for you, Lorong, again, I mean, there's this question about uh, uh, Indonesia. Uh, we were talking about reshoring possibilities to Vietnam, and there are other countries in the region where they, there are also opportunities for reshoring. So what would be the comparative advantages that you see for Indonesia as a location for uh, oh, oh, thinking re about relocation? Uh, uh, mm? Yes. So re related to this uh, uh, capacity, I think you look at the ASEAN countries, Indonesia has the largest population and the largest domestic market. Labor costs are still low and the country is full of resource. Um, and, and, and recently we see that the, the, the political situation in the country is, uh, is quite stable. The government is very, uh, very uh, progressive in, in push for domestic reform. So all, and plus um, Indonesia is a country keep good relation to the big global players, including US, EU, and also China, good re relation with China as well. So to see this um, among Asian countries, uh, many people think that Indonesia could be the next uh, miracle of uh, Asian countries, which I, I think is, it, it has its reason to there. But, um, but of course, there's some uh, kind of old problem to solve. And for Indonesia, one of them is the connectivity, that how to solve all the old problem to, in in order to create opportunities of uh, kind of a new develop opportunities. I think this is a big challenge to Indonesia uh, if we want to compare to Vietnam. Apparently Vietnam is more, uh, more open now. We can see that Vietnam has uh, several free trade agreements with US and then economic policy of EU. So all this actually bring Vietnam a big advantage um, to move, move uh, first. But that doesn't mean that country like um, Indonesia uh, will be left behind. Actually, if, if we look at the development of e-commerce, we see that Indonesian government is growing very fast. It's already taken almost half of the regional um, e-commerce market. And within five years, it, it, it probably will, will increase to more than 65% of the regional e-commerce market. And so all this solar potential that Indonesia can actually catch up and, and become a very important market in, in Asia. Yeah, I think the, the point you make about connectivity is quite important in the case of Indonesia, because in, in Indonesia is indeed a potentially big market, but actually the reality is slightly different. You know, it, it is, yeah, in theory, it's a big market. The reality is that you cannot move things around that easily within Indonesia, given the geographical size and the difficulty, yeah concrete difficulty, physical difficulty to move things uh, around. So it, it's more of a potential big market that, uh, than a real big, big market, I would, uh, I would argue. Plus, in the case of Indonesia, there's still a not totally welcoming business environment, I would say. And this is an understatement, but I don't want to be too, <laughs> too harsh on, on well, Indonesia, which is still a promising country. Well, I, I, I do agree with you. And then for Indonesia, actually, when we talk about connectivity, it's not just kind of connectivity within a country. More important is, is connectivity with its neighboring countries. And that's what we see is happening recently that, uh, that Indonesian government tried to improve that. And in related to this, uh, uh, about this welcome of foreign investor, and this is where the importance of ASEP jump in. So this is solar direction of the uh, reform of Indonesian economy. Well, thanks for making this point, which is a point that I systematically make, <laughs> which is that FTAs are not exclusively about trade. They are incidentally about trade, but they are really instruments to help countries push reform through. This is one major objective on any FTA. It is of course about tra trade liberalization to some extent, but I think a big uh, contribution of FTAs is more to help country uh, push reform through. But, okay, well, let's go back to the uh, questions. Uh, so, uh, uh, all right, a question about China. Uh, so who wants to take the question about China by Angelo Pugliese? China's apparent success in containing COVID-19, China's digitalization, as well as foreign SMEs and MEs, poor economic health, 
because of lower demand suggests that there is little appetite for reshoring away from China, quite the contrary. Well, there's, we already discussed this a little bit, but there are some other reasons that are given here for ref or not refusing, but being reluctant to reshore or to move away from China. Do you uh, agree with this other explanations? The explanation we gave so far was that uh, companies were not too thrilled about moving away from China because China is still a big market. But there are some other reasons that are given here, suggested here. What, uh, what do you think? Do you think this um, explanation may, makes sense? Or do you think the market explanation is really the most important explanation of companies staying in China? Um, yeah, I, I think I have some um, uh, comments on this. And um, first, um, I think that's possible, but in addition to the, the concern of this Chinese big market, one concern is that how uh, uh, the process of digital transform transformation in China. We know China is very uh, technically in this 5G technology. And then thinking about the e-payment, thinking about the online business, um, many people uh, who visit China will agree that it's quite convenient to use this uh, e-solution in, in China. So um, we talk about the slowdown of Chinese economy and because of the increasing uh, labor costs and whatever. So one possibility is China use this uh, new uh, competitiveness it build up by adopting digital technology to to build up a new competitive age to attract foreign investor to produce here. So even the labor is more expensive, but here we have more um, a convenient internet, more high, uh, more efficient connectivity to facilitate your business. So that could possibly compensate its loss in labor costs and then uh, uh, attract more company to come and then. Uh, uh, of course, then refuel the fast growth of Chinese uh, economy. That's 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 possible, but but um, but uh, but we don't know. We don't know to what degree COVID can can uh, can kind of provide more time for China to 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 do that. Uh, I I think it will take longer. Then we then we then we think. Yeah. Anybody else on that? No. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Shin, please. Yeah, Shen, you wanted to say something? Or I yeah, have another question for you. Mute. Yeah, yeah, I am mute. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with Du Dong. I mean, uh, there are I mean several elements, of course. And this uh, person who question this uh, mentioned uh, why now Chinese uh, economy recovered quicker quickly, more quickly than other economy. So at this stage, uh, uh, keeping business in China can be beneficial. This is the element for staying in China. But at the same time, as Rudo mentioned, that uh, uh, in uh, medium longer term, uh, the labor cost is increasing quickly. And also at the same time, uh, there was a vulnerability element regarding that the huge debt in China, and also uh, I mean, uh, perceived risk uh, viewing from foreign countries or foreign companies. I mean, uh, that uh, uh, they are but we, uh, I mean, uh, often utilizing so-called economic cohesion kind of things. And also US, of course, it depends on that the new Biden administration, uh, what kind of policy they are going to utilize. However, uh, tension is uh, very intensified. So many Japanese companies, of course, doing business not only with China, but also US, US market is also important. So if particular tension is very high, of course, this is one element for uh, they to reconsider who are staying or increasing China's business. So there are elements for uh, staying there and also there are elements for that relocating from there. I was muted. Uh, yeah, there's one more, one more question for you, Lurong, on ASEAN countries. Are ASEAN countries competing against each other or are they more or less organizing themselves so as to be complementary? Well, I um, have my own views on that, but I let you respond. <laughs> I'll see whether yeah, I concur with you or not. It's kind of dangerous to answer the question directly, but um, I, I think that the, 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 the balance is that the way ASEAN is that true try to create a kind of fair competition environment for country to, for, to facilitate business sector to compete and create opportunities. So um, 
and 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 that's I think that's one um, mission of us instead try to remove those regulatory barriers and try to improve uh, the market integration to provide more competitive environment. So uh, to make sure that every, to make sure that development is inclusive and everyone can can benefit from this process. You know, I, I would add uh, that actually the private sector, and when I mean the private sector, what I have in mind is primarily Japanese companies, actually are quite instrumental in enhancing the complementarity between the various ASEAN countries. If you, if you look at the, the way Japanese companies are organized within ASEAN, they are actually yeah, instrumental in connecting the various countries within ASEAN. And what I, I what I'm referring to uh, here is precisely the automotive sector with Thailand as the main location of production, but sourcing from various ASEAN countries. Of course, this is possible to some extent thanks to ASEAN regulations, but it is also possible thanks to specific uh, mechanisms that have been put in place like the ICO uh, system, the ASEAN Industrial Cooperation, whatever, I can, can't remember what the O stands for. Uh, so there were specific uh, mechanisms in place to facilitate the uh, precisely the, well, the organization of supply chains within ASEAN. But this was not really uh, the result of uh, ASEAN decisions. It was more the result of specific mechanisms that were made use of by private companies. But that's my personal view. Shin, you want to add something on that? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, so Japanese companies uh, carry out trade uh, within uh, I mean, intra-ASEAN trade from Thai subsidiary to the, the Indonesian subsidiary kind of things. So this facilitates more trade. And also another positive externality is that the Japanese company or other uh, foreign companies too, uh, they invest there and they are complaining business condition. This is, I think, public goods. They need to, uh, they require that improvement of business condition. So if the government, recipient countries or that the destiny government improve uh, that the business condition, this benefit not only the foreign company, but also domestic companies too. So FDI is good in various meaning, I think. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, per perhaps one, one question to, to Thibault. Uh, on the, the barometer. Well, you mentioned very briefly and very quickly uh, the changes that you had observed. Well, yeah, you were restricted by time, I, I agree. Uh, but yeah, you talked about the change that you observed from the last year barometer and this year barometer. I, I don't remember how for how many years you've been uh, uh, conducting this, uh, this survey. And what I would li like to know is whether there have been structural changes that you observe over time, over a longer period of time, not just last year compared to this year, but over a longer period of time. Uh, unfortunately, it's the second year we performed this barometer. Oh, okay, but, uh, it's, a, it's just one. <laughs> yeah, All right. but I, I have, um, what we did last year was, was in fact much a wider barometer asking to, uh, to the companies how they manage uh, supply chain risk for last year. So, uh, we 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 there there were not so so many changes for between 20, 2019 and 2015 i guess uh the, the in terms of uh, um, what, what was the real concern uh, about risk supply chain uh, before really uh, it was was really the the potential impact of uh, natural disasters uh, across the globe because uh, as uh, so yeah, I mentioned that uh, there, there was a huge uh, impact of in 2011 related to the Japanese earthquake, related to uh, the flood in uh, South uh, South South Asia, and uh, and, and these uh, remained in the in the, in the, in the mind of uh, of all the people who suffered from uh, from the consequences of, of these events, and uh, so so that was a really really important matter for them, and uh, the emerging uh, trend that we we saw also last year. Was about the cyber risk, and, uh, and and this trend, I would uh, I think that it will, will increase in the, in the in the next years related to the supply chain risk because uh, all the companies are are now connected in in, in many different ways. Uh, we all use more and more 
digital tool to to collaborate and to exchange data and to and to work. I mean, basically. So um, so the, this um, trend of the, the cyber risk in the supply chain of operation uh, will really be a focus of of uh, yeah, of risk prevention for the, for the years to come. And um, the, the major companies will clearly uh, need to, and they already do that. Uh, I will support the suppliers in, in cyber resilience and cyber protection uh, to be sure that they are not uh, yes, contaminated or infected by, by, by a virus or, or, or by the potential consequences of, uh, of uh, disruption from, from a cyber attack uh, at their suppliers. Yeah, cybersecurity is certainly, must be certainly very high on the priority uh, list. Uh, another question to, to you, Shin, uh, about this um, supply chain initiative that J J Japan took together with uh, India and Australia. So can, can you say more about this? So what, what, uh, what is it exactly and what, what is uh, the point? And do you think that uh, additional countries may actually join this uh, initiative? Yes, uh, you are right. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> we, I mean, uh, agreed uh, first together with uh, uh, India and also Australia uh, in cooperation on the supply chain. And also after that, uh, Japan and ASEAN said that we cooperate on the uh, uh, strength in the supply chain. So of, of course, this is a good thing. But uh, I don't think this is exclusive one, and uh, outreach is also important. Uh, so not only this area, but also other country can join and cooperate for uh, this kind of supply chain uh, initiative. But ASEAN is very important, and as I mentioned, many, many Japanese companies invest already invested in ASEAN. So it's quite natural uh, when that the Prime Minister Suga visited uh, there, uh, they agree that uh, cooperation on supply chain. And also India is a very uh, big uh, market too. And India is very uh, serious and very uh, eager to get the benefit coming from diversification and relocation from China. So they're very eager. And of course, for us, India is a very important uh, country. So again, this is quite natural for us to uh, I mean, uh, agree in cooperation. But uh, return, uh, going back to your question, this is not exclusive. Uh, I mean, uh, we can add, for example, United States, this is also important country and we can cooperate. And also possibly that Africa, this is a huge market and expanding. So uh, when we try to uh, I mean, explore this African market, cooperating with India, this is a very uh, useful uh, uh, instrument because there are strong presence, uh, uh, Indian presence in Africa. So this is a kind of first step, not exclusive, I think. Okay, but in concrete terms, so what, what, what are the measures that are taken to, uh, <laughs> to precisely pr protect or uh, make this, uh, this supply chain more secure? What, 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 what is it that, they, that the countries are actually doing? Uh, what is this initiative all about? Uh, part number one, <clears throat> even though Japanese government thinks that uh, I mean uh, too much reliance on China is not good things, however, company uh, will not go to other area if investment climate is not sufficient enough. So we can have a communication with uh, ASEAN country. ASEAN is making already a lot of effort, but also for example with India how to improve improving uh, uh, investment climate this is number one. And possibly uh, one element of investment climate is infrastructure. And we have uh, that, uh, JICA and also JBIC, so we can cooperate how to improve uh, infrastructure kind of things. So there are various area for us to explore. Supply chain is one element, but supply chain element can be expanded. So that, that's my understanding. Uh, and uh, uh, the mm -hmm. uh, joint statement itself is big and uh, not, not detailed, but the very thing is uh, started to be discussed. That's my understanding. Okay. So uh, if I understand properly, so you are, we are back to connectivity issues again. So the, the point is really through this initiative to make things 
easier for for companies but it's a, it's an indirect way of uh, facilitating the establishment value chains it's not directive it is just uh, yeah creating the appropriate environment so that um, well, supply chains can develop but it's an it's an indirect uh, support to supply chains if i understand properly what you what you're saying working about infrastructure we're working on connectivity so that's precisely you know, helping uh, paving the way for the development of uh, value chains or supply chains do i understand yeah, properly that's right but, but, but not only not, not only infrastructure and those are not only connectivity but also for example that uh, i mean uh, how tax authority is actually taxing them or how uh, registration office it takes i mean one month two months uh, how long will it take for uh, getting uh, power kind of things so the world bank doing business this is very important uh, but not only world bank uh, japan also this can, and actually this has already been done but enhancing this kind of activity can benefit not only japanese companies but also the uh, recipient countries yeah well so it's, a, it's a really helping uh, improving the environment so that business environment, broadly speaking, be it physically or regu from a regulatory perspective. Yeah, that's right. Okay, okay, I understand that. Uh, all right. Uh, are there any other questions coming from the audience? I, I don't think so. Uh, well, if ever you have anything to add, please, it's the time. <laughs> I'm running out of questions by myself uh, as well. I don't think there are any more questions. Well, per perhaps one, yeah. Okay, well, Shane, if you want to add something and then we'll con conclude on our step, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, actually, uh, we discussed supply chain issue and the reshoring or near shoring kind of things. Uh, I think uh, if uh, it makes sense economically and from the viewpoint of risk, reshoring is okay. But sometimes a uh, person who advocate reshoring has uh, another agenda that uh, protectionist sentiment or mercantilist sentiment, they want to increase employment in domestically kind of things. I'm to be honest against this kind of idea because uh, this will weaken not only uh, that other trading partner, but also the country itself. Because uh, I mean, uh, country cannot uh, I mean uh, prosper if they try to uh, go to that otaki type of activity. So I think we have to be very careful uh, about such kind of uh, policy. Uh, I just want to mention this. Thank you. No, I think you're perfectly right. Thibault, you want to add something on this? I see you nodding. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm completely agree. Uh, if we, if, if, if the, there are too much reshoring and, and, to, and, and I would, it will weaken the relationship between countries. Uh, and as you mentioned, the trade, uh, the, uh, the, the trade agreements are really a, a, a bond uh, between one country and another, and it's really important that we keep this kind of, uh, of, of, of policy everywhere as much as we can to, to uh, enforce, uh, I would say, if we go to, to that point, uh, to enforce peace, of course. Yeah, but I, I guess what you, what you were saying, Shin, is very much that the trade of efficiency security is very, well, should be very subtly handled. Or, or solved. Efficiency is one, one thing, and it is extremely important, and it should not be sacrificed <laughs> for security. Because as you rightly say, behind this economic security concept, a number of things can be hidden. And a number of things that have very little to do with economic security, and which may have a lot to do with other forms of supposed security. And so the politicization of this trade-off may be really problematic. And so the, 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 the real challenge is to strike a balance between these two objectives of security on the one hand, which of course should be uh, an important priority, uh, an important objective. But there is the other <laughs> uh, objective, which is efficiency. And at the end of the day, economics is about efficiency. And so we have to strike a balance between these two. And this trade-off is, is really tricky but it shouldn't be, uh, yeah, I, I think that efficiency shouldn't be sacrificed for uh, uh, supposed security. Because security can mean a number of things and not necessarily uh, the appropriate things. And that's my understanding, but I'm an economist and I, get, I, I guess I may be a bit biased. So any, anybody on concluding remarks about this uh, 
philosophical thought. <laughs> Anybody wants to add something? No, Shin, Laurent? No, you agree with me that the, that may be the concluding word? Oh, please, Shin, you will have the last word. Yeah, I, I agree with you, uh, but, but maybe slightly different thing is that uh, I think efficiency and resilience, there is trade-off. So if we think uh, as a company, as a country, resilience is more important from a viewpoint of political dynamic, efficiency has to be sacrificed to some extent. But what I'm against is this trade-off become uh, efficiency and protectionism. This is not the right trade-off. Trade-off should be efficiency and resilience. That's my point. Maybe almost the same as you. <laughs> yeah. You put it a different way, but uh, no, I agree with you. So Lurong, you want to add something? Yeah, please. Yes, just very quick, quick remarks. Actually, these two um, objections doesn't need, doesn't need to be kind of against each other. And one issue I want to highlight is that building trust could be the solution to bring both together. And okay. actually this is also a very fundamental things that countries decided to join the GBC and, 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 and share the production. So I think building trust, or we call it rebuild the trust, will be very important. Thank you. Okay, I was looking for the title of this OECD study that I mentioned. Uh, I should be able to find it to just uh, wait a second. I'll of course, when you look for something, you don't find it. Okay, well, uh, I'll do my best to find it and I will find it. And so uh, it will be circulated, it will be uh, yeah, circulated to the, uh, to the audience because a number of people ask for it. So I'll, I'll give you the exact reference to the study, which I still cannot find. Okay, well, I'll, I'll communicate it to you, to, to you all, all of you and the audience, don't, don't worry. So I think that uh, well, we, we have to put an, uh, a close to this uh, very interesting discussion, very lively discussion. So thanks to all of the panelists for uh, their participation. Thanks for the uh, audience for their questions and patience. And I wish you nice yeah, day, evening, uh, I, I don't know exactly what I should say to you, Shin, since you are <laughs> located in Washington, it's very late at night. So I don't know whether you are a, an early riser <laughs> or, or not. Okay, well, have a nice day, everybody. Have a nice evening, uh, Lorong, and I hope to see you soon in person at some point, wherever that is, Jakarta, Paris, Washington, good news. Have a nice day, bye-bye, and thank you a lot again.